In the year 2000, Fortune magazine released an article titled 10 Stocks to Last a Decade. And had you listened to that article, by December 2012, your portfolio's value would have dropped by 73.4%. Those kind of predictions are the exact reason why I've created for myself seven golden rules when it comes to my personal investing. And if you haven't even started investing, it's completely fine because a couple of the rules that I've created apply to people before they've even bought their first share. Get your house in order first. Of course, I mean this strictly in the financial sense and there are two steps that I took before I even put away my first pound into investment. The first being, building an emergency fund. This is where you put aside three to six months worth of living expenses in an easy to access account, preferably with high interest, but that's not so important. And that money is there for the worst case scenarios. Imagine losing your job on the same day that you owe rent and your car breaks down and your boiler breaks down, those kind of days. Building an emergency fund will give you the confidence and stability to go on and start investing, but not before you've done step two, pay off high interest debt. There is zero point trying to get high returns through investing when you have a credit card bill due at 20% interest. And the question that should be popping into your mind at this point is, well, what's considered high interest debt? And in order to figure that out, you need to calculate your magic number. For me, I like to invest into US stock markets and on average over the past 20 years, they've returned 8.9% annually. What I do next is add a 3% buffer onto that number, bringing it down to roughly 6%. And that's my magic number. Any debt with an interest rate higher than 6%, I consider high interest debt and I will pay it off aggressively before a single penny goes towards an investment. Once you've done that, you're almost ready to start investing, but not before you've completed rule number two. Learn the basics. I mean, yes, I can agree it does sound obvious, but you wouldn't trust a financial advisor who had only ever studied geography. So why do you trust yourself to put your money into an investment that you know nothing about? And no, you don't need to become Einstein to learn about investing. And to be honest, you've already started your education by watching this video. Bravo. I'll be honest with you, watching this 30 minute video by Ali Abdel was enough for me personally to start my investing journey. And I've even made an investing video which you can watch and will put you in good stead to start yourself. I'll leave a few other great resources that won't take a lot of your time in the description. And in my honest opinion, a 30 minute trade off to be able to invest for the rest of your life is more than worth it. Oh, but don't click any of those until you finish this video, obviously. Rule three, don't touch the principle. Unlike money that goes into my savings, let's say, I consider the money in my investments as gone. And by gone, I literally mean that money does not belong to me anymore and I cannot touch it for any reason whatsoever. It's not for buying a property with, it's not for buying a coffee with, it's simply not mine. You see, my objective of investing is to create a pool of wealth that I can live off infinitely. And one of the easiest ways to explain how I'm doing this is through the 4% rule. This rule states that if you only take 4% of your portfolio's value every single year, you you should be able to live off that money infinitely. Let's say I need 40,000 pounds a year to live. That means I just need to build a portfolio of 1 million pounds to be able to live indefinitely. Money wise, I'm not immortal. And by doing that, I will quite literally never have to touch the principal amount that I've put into that investment because I'll be living off the returns. But until that point, what exactly am I doing with my returns? Great question for myself, because that brings us very nicely to rule number four, reinvest your returns. The only way I can really explain this one to you is with maths. Take two people. They both invest 20,000 pounds into the stock market. They both let it sit there for 40 years. They both get the average historical return of the S&P of 10%. But the only difference between them is that person A takes out their returns whilst person B reinvests them. After 40 years, person A will end up with their 20,000 principal that they put in, plus will have been able to take out £2,000 a year for those 40 years, earning them £80,000 in interest. Person B, on the other hand, will also be able to take out their £20,000 worth of principal, but their interest will be £885,000. Now, you would think that maths alone would convince anyone to keep their returns within their investments, but it doesn't, which is why I had to create rule number five. Don't look at your investment. I will happily be the first person to admit that I did not abide by this rule when I started investing. I mean, quite the opposite. I was looking at my investment account three times a day at the minimum. But I soon found out that if I continued down this route, I was quite literally building a recipe for disaster. I mean, just take a look alone at how volatile the S&P has been over the past month and year. But what you need to understand is when you zoom out the bigger picture, of its entire history, it always has trended upwards. So by not looking at your investments, you're not going to be frightened by this short-term volatility. Dollar cost averaging. 
The simple definition of this is putting a fixed amount of money into your investment on a regular basis every period, regardless of what the market is doing. In other words, you are the opposite of trying to time the market. You are putting in no matter what. Of course, in an ideal world, everyone would want to try and buy the dip. But unless you have some kind of insider information, you're not going to be able to do that. I'm not condoning illegal activity at this point, by the way. So why does dollar cost averaging work? Well, by putting in a fixed amount, regardless of what the market is doing, you'll hope to average out the returns. And with the market trending upwards, this is going to work in your favor. But if that hasn't convinced you, a simple experiment was run recently, taking a look at the past 30 years of doing a dollar cost average tactic versus trying to buy the dip. And as expected, dollar cost averaging wiped the floor with buying the dip. And that is without even considering the time and the stress it would take to try and predict the market. And whilst we're talking about stress, it's a good time to mention rule number seven, which is what I personally use to decrease the amount of stress associated with investing. Diversification. Investing is risky. There, I said it, I'll admit it. But there are certain tools that you can use to reduce the risk. And this one happens to be my favorite. Investing in just one stock is one of the riskiest things you can do because if that company disappears, all of your money disappears. Investing in two stocks slightly starts to reduce that risk. 10 stocks even more so, but I personally choose to invest in thousands of stocks. By doing this, if one of those companies choose to perform badly or disappear, I'm hardly gonna notice. You might be wondering, how can you have the time or the money to buy thousands of stocks? And the way that I do this is through ETFs, which are pretty much pre-made baskets of stocks ready for you to buy. And some that I choose to go for are the S&P 500 or the VWRL fund by Vanguard. In life, there is no way of trying to get a reward without some kind of risk. So why not try and mitigate that risk right now by implementing rule number two and watching this video over here. After that, come back and implement the rest of the rules. So you're 